Jai Hind, Jai Bharat, and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. Looking at our neighborhood, one country comes across in terms of the news, which is supposed to be very close to us, ethnically, religiously, and of course culturally, but still seems so far away. That country is Nepal. There are loads of things happening in that country in terms of politics, in terms of, let me just say it directly, China, and of course India. What is the reality of Nepal? There are there are conflicting news coming out every month, and there is of course the communist revolution, if I may use that word very carefully, which is which is there in Nepal, which prevents a lot of things from actually coming towards India. So, what's the reality? What's the game in Nepal? Let's discuss with Dr. Keita Kocher, somebody who I admire quite a bit with regards to her knowledge and her in-depth experience about these particular issues. Ma'am, thank you so much for taking out the time and talking to us and helping us understand this whole riddle called Nepal. Jaihan to your viewers and thank you very much, Adit, for uh, again inviting me to your channel. It's always a pleasure to discuss with you. It's like cool and, you know, really calm ways of discussing things and going through all the nitty gritties of wherever we can uh, for a little longer time. Uh, people also enjoy, though it's a little long video, but I enjoy many of your videos, really. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for the compliment. Ma'am, uh, what's up with Nepal, ma'am? What's the game? I mean, the Communist Party is there. We know that. But, you know, one in India, the, the perception is that the culture, the religion, the ethnicity, the, you know, the, the values of, of the similar land would kind of keep these two countries together. But there is that difference that always comes about, which is a lot of people blame it on the Communist Party of Nepal. Is that true? What is the game here? I mean, we should understand Nepal in a very holistic manner rather than, you know, bits and pieces of what is happening in the news. You know, people are often taken, you know, by the narratives which are floated every time in the media. Some, so these these are news items, okay? But this does not reflect the reality of Nepal. I've seen one of the videos in, in your channel itself where, you know, uh, you discussed on Nepal and he had a good experience about staying in Nepal and, you know, traveling across to Nepal. But... Nepal to me is, uh, I mean, let's let's start from you know how Nepal has struggled its way to be, to have its true identity as a nation state uh, that that has rich civilization and cultural heritage. Okay, and if I see the multiplicity of ethnic communities in Nepal and the cultural amalgamation it has gone through, Nepal itself is over the centuries built up by you know say 54 small kingdoms and so ethnic nationalities are there uh, so it's a multi-ethnic um, you know a culturally cohabited community sort of a place uh, where you find all kinds of cultures flourishing and so the Tibetans are also there uh, therefore the crux of locating for me as a Nepal's identity and uh, is not being a sovereign nation state as now people are like trying to impose on us, okay, Nepal is a sovereign state, please deal with us with a sovereign, you know, perspective. Uh, it is not in under India's, you know, rule or something like that. Uh, it can deal with India, it can deal with uh, China, whatever. But I see Nepal more as an embodiment of a civilizational state. And the moment I say civilizational state, I have to, you know, locate the civilization of Nepal. Where is that civilization coming from? I mean, if you just look from the present nation state, you know, uh, framework, maybe you will say, okay, Nepal is uh, uh, a buffer state between India and China, right? That is what people always call. And so it is trying to balance itself between India and China and things like that. But I don't see that way. I see the problem exists where you start looking Nepal's identity as a sovereign state itself and not as a civilizational state. I'm not denying that it is a sovereign state. But it is also a civilization state. And that is where each individual Nepal is, you know, having its own cultural identity, its own uh, reflection of what Nepali is all about. And here, you know, there are two things which, uh, which makes the heterogeneity more complex. Is the differentiation within Nepal about the Tarai people, that is the Madesi people, as well as the, you know, the other section we call the elitist at times also, uh, basically the. A uh, whole of other Nepal, which are dominated by the Gorkhas and the, you know, uh, Nivars and all of that, right? And so there are these 
ethnic communities where you have the tharus the you know the madhesis and janjatis and all of that and the nevadis who are again the original the gorkhas and all of that plus there is this tibetan you know community which is flourishing which is which is a your you know a reflection which is a very small community actually but a reflection of the china but if i see the civilizational context then you see more of it coming from the indus civilization okay and so there is a lot of influence of india like say for example the history if i tell if if you will allow me to you know speak a little bit of the historical records of what nepal is all about uh, the first known uh, you know um records of historical records of nepal says it was a lichvi king of uh, susupta was an aryan king okay and the earliest inhabitants of nepal uh, were uh, people from the indus valley civilization as i am just pointing out so if you see the book of say krishna p bhatarai uh, his book on nepal you know the title of the book itself is nepal uh, he identifies nepal to the roots of hindu mythology okay which locates nepal in the age of truth now he states that manu the first human being and the king of the world ruled the territory during that time and was called the land of truth now you see how that nepal connotation comes out okay and so nepal is a place of spirituality as we know of meditation as we know uh, and is also something like i feel is a place of salvation of eternal you know freedom and all sort of things and the same reflection uh, is there in the hindu legends if i see you know the importance of uh, nepal as the birth of uh, sita we know right in mithila kingdom uh, the king of janak where uh, we have the present day janakpur area of nepal and later married to rama you know the seventh incarnation of lord vishnu so interestingly you know uh, apart from these hindu things uh, the gautam buddha you know they say that uh, he was he, he's also incarn his incarnation of lord vishnu was believed to be born in lumbini right so all of these will point you to a nepal which is civilization wise uh, or historically if i see is a place of more as a hindu rashtra okay and if you see when the unity of nepal happened all the you know 54 small kingdoms were united by prithviraj uh, prithvi narayan shah he made nepal into a hindu state and till date if you know that you know you can't have cow slaughter in nepal it is banned you see so that way all the nepalis have ideology which is very much to the core of hinduism more than what we have in india in india we have still developed a lot okay now what is the problem that is happening uh, in nepal as as we see the 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 paradox of communist and you know the indians and things like that is after the federal democratic republic of nepal was established because the moment this was done you know there was whole this notion of creating a secular state that came into nepal okay so the historical you know uh, the king's uh, you know the legacy of king uh, who was basically the rajput rulers uh, that was overthrown by the present regime present political establishment and they created the federal democratic republic right and uh, so what happened is that uh, you find that you know the whole notions of what is a secular state has come into there is i mean the the notion of being a democratic state has created this diversity of no we are an other culture even during say 80s or something 70s 80s i'm talking about you know there was this whole flood of gypsy culture in nepal right which which we have seen in some of the bollywood movies as well and this started i would see this is the second infiltration of the culture the first i would say is during uh you know when nepal established diplomatic relations with uh, china and then the tibetans you know refugees started flourishing in uh, flooding in uh, nepal that was the fun, first uh, you know pollution i would say or infiltration of nepali culture the nepali you know core hindu culture the second i would say is the gypsy culture and third is this period that we are talking today where 
there is lot of communism which has come in uh, you know the 50s and 60s when diplomatic relations were established they were the people who started to get influenced by communism and then there was this whole 10 year of civil war in nepal right and during the civil war you know all the maoist were trying to you know go to the rural areas the roots of nepal actually and then they started to you know uh, give them hopes and dreams of communism so the rural nepal now is highly influenced by these communist ideologies okay and because of that you know there is this infiltration of communism which has come into that hindu ideology so what has happened in nepal is i would see every individual is living in a paradoxical situation say for example prachanda ji okay who is a prime minister now we know that he is a hardcore maoist everyone knows about he was the one who was pioneer in you know uh, the 10 year revolution and things like that but if you see when his son who was very uh, you know uh, very young and dynamic when he died all the rituals were hindu rituals he performed all the hindu rituals uh, for his last rites right even this time when he visited uh, you know india people have started to you know uh, make a whole story in nepal the moment he went back you know there's whole debate in nepal about why he went to hindu temples hi his core is a hindu you can't take out the soul of a person from the body it's something like that i i believe that i mean when i interact with the nepalese even if they are you know they are like really too pro china because of the economic success which china has made they are they are really communist in their ideologies some of them are very hardcore maoist as well and uh, they talk to me in terms of socialism only you see socialism is the only way to bring peace to the whole world to bring equality in the land and all of that you know uh, we in nepal can root out poverty if there is communism all of that right these are the people who would be talking like that but the moment i would live with them for a certain period of time when i start you know talking to them about how they look at indian women how they talk about the you know family notions right how they they perform certain rituals again that will boil down to the hindu thing so so if somebody says nepal is getting carried away by the chinese see the example of why ncp you know broke off why the communist regime which is a combined of two parties of uml and maoist could not sustain they can't because even if the chinese are supporting or you know giving the material benefits you know hopes of all of that xi jinping ji went there and uh, you know literally threatened them not to do something against you know uh, china in terms of uh, in terms of tibetan refugees and things like that sort of separatist movements or division uh, the nepalese were really threatened right yet they're back to india so india and nepal i always say that you cannot break these civilizational cultural ties at any point of time you can politically create you know the political leaders do create that nationalist discourses of anti india there is a whole rhetoric youngsters are so brainwashed for uh, you know bringing up anti india sentiments because of all kinds of issues but you can't break them it's that that cultural identity which i locate nepal and to there are other things as as i said there are other communities who have uh, especially the dipton communities who have their own you know cultural identity which is which may be pro to you know china uh, but this is the aryan culture this is the hindu culture this is the hindu civilization and today very interestingly the debate in nepal is again to bring back the monarchy you see so this is where i think today nepal stands i mean of course we we can continue uh, our discussion on how china has influence and all of that and what is happening in china by china's influence in nepal but this is the overall picture i see of nepal yeah ma'am i want to you know the chinese influence this that i think is very well covered i want to understand the core then you can actually understand how nepal will react to certain situation how they actually think So let me ask you this very point blank: What do they think about China? What is their thought process with regards to the Chinese help in quotes uh, coming towards their way? 
and of course the nibbling that the chinese do on 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 their borders and their land uh, this thing in the eyes is a matter of fact that the chinese have right down to the tarai region so what is the thought process yes yeah, so so as i said when the civil war happened okay in nepal uh, because this civil war the base of these civil war were the rural areas right in nepal and so the the rural areas are basically influenced a lot by the communism and the dream of communism right and the maoist revolution is the one which came to power by overthrowing the you know the regime right prachanda became the prime minister after the after the civil war so once they came to the mainstream you know there was a whole lot of support for the uh, the the regime that is the the revolution that had happened but because nepal has suffered a lot because of this 10 years of turmoil and because the kind of you know bomb blast and during elections and all kinds of you know negative things that were happening uh, of uh, you know rapes and murders and killings and all of kind of you know chaotic things that were happening i think the the younger class of nepal is not very satisfied by just this dream you know of what communism is all about but having said that i think we really need to understand even china nepal relations is a very complex relationship for the for the reason that even if the nepalese think about you know uh, they do talk about the the older relationship of nepal you know the uh, i mean apart they don't talk so much about the wars the two wars china nepal fought with uh, china uh, maybe because uh, in the last war that is 78 uh, 89 1778 uh, 89 um, the nepalese lost the gorkha you know uh, army lost and the qing government who supported the tibetans they came to support the tibetans and then uh, the nepalese had the brunt of the loss maybe that is a deep scar for the gorkha army maybe that is the reason they don't talk i don't know maybe that that is there somewhere down the line but they talk about the china nepal relations in terms of the you know the the relationship that was built by uh, nepalese in terms of birkuti you know being married to the tibetan this thing and then they talk about how china has now at, in the recent times uh, made economic success so economic success model of china and the development that it has brought to many states you know many provinces of china is something which nepal really wants for its own people okay so this is where nepalese look at china as a dream for their future right before china became so successful in its economic you know endeavor nepalese were highly influenced by the americans so if you see the time from the gypsy culture i talked about to the present in nepal every nepalese dream was to go to america it's sort of an american dream right and now i mean coming to india was it's like their home they never thought that you know they have to go to india to do something they thought we have all relatives there there were all kinds of linkages in india so india is a part of them okay india did not have a great economic success also the country did not uh, become so modernized you know uh, within these decades we were talking about so india was not never a charm for the nepalese it was like a home for them right but america was the charm the west was a charm for them and now as china you know gradually developed and uh, chinese started to give them lot of scholarships and many nepalese went for their doctorate degrees and other kind of you know uh, trainings they started to look at china also with a vision of a dream this is what they want to become this is what they want for nepal and chinese have sold a lot of you know dreams to the nepalese you see Uh, so there is one perception which is already created when you are in poverty say for a rural area if a poor person comes to the city uh, the person would want a city life right so that dream is already there for the nepalis because uh, again if you see the kind of poverty absolute poverty in nepal is huge right and so there was this dream of 
becoming like an american having freedom like america the democracy this that but developing like the chinese so nepalese at the core do think about china as a country which can support them financially okay so the main interest for the nepalese leadership to the individual level is a financial support okay uh and here i would see that china has done a lot of things you know um, if you see the closeness china has uh, you know given to nepal uh, inclination is there in terms of uh, say building up china study centers where they tell you about chinese culture the greatness of the chinese culture already they were influenced about the chinese communism and now they have this study centers which tell you about the greatness of chinese cultures and then you have the dissemination of the language then you have the you know the other closeness of china and we'll talk about it later about military ties right and then because of these scholarships you know the nepalese went there and realized that there is a a better life that they can have and better life in terms of material benefits i'm talking about and so because nepal is also a tourist state right it's more dependent on tourism uh you know the chinese were coming with a lot of money and spending a lot in nepal uh there was a huge business uh, you know contacts between china and nepal and so the nepalese were getting a lot of money because of that okay one of the things which i realized when i went to nepal even in 2014 uh, and i have very few visits after that in nepal uh i realized that many of the shops you know were taken by these chinese who were paying them more than what the nepalese could afford as a rent okay say for example the gorkhas are coming to kathmandu and renting a shop or a, you know place to stay right and they are running the business but the chinese will come and give them twice or at times four times the rent the gorkha was giving and take up this shop okay so now the the owner of that place would feel that he is giving a lot of money right and for them money is very important now i mean more of the nepalese are very very materialistic in many senses and this culture has spread across and that is why you see a highly corrupt society right which is evolving in nepal and so when they were getting this much money they thought that you know chinese are the best to be given so every nepalese were trying to find out a nepalese who could rent their shop or rent their apartment and the situation evolved by 2014 or 16 you would see that whole of thamil thamil is supposed to be the main market hub of nepal uh, of kathmandu the whole of thamil was literally taken over by the chinese shopkeepers so you had all chinese restaurants there the authentic chinese food because the chinese were coming and you know paying and developing and doing whatever all the uh, the uh, the labors were all from the china from china the managers were from china and the owners became the chinese and they were all rented to the chinese i used to at that point of time discuss with the nepalese and say that you know what will happen if all your own people are not given these opportunities and the, all the opportunities are taken by the chinese so basically you are working for the chinese and not for your own people which is what was happening which is what truly happened before before the covid period the situation in nepal was chinese were not just the traders ordinary traders in nepal but they were the market controllers and when i say market controllers i'm talking about the restaurants the you know food stalls the 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 cloth market the uh, you know the electronic items and they used to be chinese good market separately your voice that, is not coming that is yeah. i mean i was just snickering away to glory that uh, china created a whole ecosystem for itself for it to survive right that's quite right. funny for me ma'am but you know the interesting thing about nepal is that you you mentioned about the closeness that they found in material pleasures and that's something which is very uh, I agree with that. ठीक है, fair enough. They wanted personal comfort and बिचारे इतने time तक civil war में थे. They were yeah. a you know very tough country to live in. You got mountains, ये वो सब कुछ अपने आप करना पड़ता है वहाँ पर. It's a very cold country, very tough yeah. environment to stay in. So fair enough, understandable. 
but you know you can expect that out of a person you can expect that out of an, a group of individuals you can't expect that out of a country now are you trying to hint that the nepalese government itself were also looking for similar material pleasures for itself and probably the country it's a, a country so that's why they kind of bent towards china quite a bit of course there there would be a lot of coaxing from the uh, pretty chinese ambassadors that they keep sending across from china there would be a lot of screw tightening happening there but what was the process what was the thought process of these leaders to go sit in the chinese lap yeah i mean uh, i would uh, not deny the fact that you you're saying that the leaders are uh, literally coaxed by the chinese money actually i mean if you see the level of corruption in nepal i mean one of the highest levels i would say uh, it's highly corrupt so where does this corruption begin from the political leadership right i mean i have seen the cases for uh, many cases of corruption uh, which have been exposed in nepal starting from baburam bhattarai's wife and you know to to many other leaders who are into this corrupt practices from the home minister to every every individual you would see and they would have a wealth in crores right and you see the uh, the ordinary people of nepal there's a huge junk of nepalese who are suffering who are poor there are villages where uh, you know people are selling their kidneys to get money you right so it, it's that pathetic i mean there are whole villages where you know uh, nepalese are selling their you know the women of the villages sending to india or to gulf countries or to other countries for the sake of money so so that extreme poverty and you have these crores of wealth in the hands of say 1 or 2% of the whole population so this extreme gap is because of the material wealth that is created and the awe that is created by the the chinese or you know as i said the western world right the europeans have also funded a lot to to nepal but having said that i mean as a state whether that should be the the vision or not right say for example uh, when uh, in 2017 and all when uh, this you know united communist came to power the ncp we call it national Com- you know communist party or combination of uml and the maoist okay uh, when they came to power and prime minister uh, oli was the prime minister oli was the prime minister at that point of time he was talking about samriddh nepal sukhi nepali right a phrase that was mainly to root out corruption for the economic development of nepal and for the welfare benefit of every individual of nepal right but when you see the actual actions that took place right uh, was because bri was already signed by that time uh, they were looking at projects with you know nepal uh, with china sorry and uh, they were trying to have a dissection from indian dependency the whole whole vision or that they floated was a dissection from the indian side right uh, not to be overly dependent on india and to be dependent on china so the hydro pro- power projects were the chinese they were looking for the energy and oil you know uh, links with china they were looking for pipelines because of the 2015 blockade that happened you know they thought uh, india is not reliable so we should go to china and china is going to be a reliable partner and and so they they i mean the whole leaders narrative of coming to power was anti india every leader if you see in the history of nepal in the in the post you know federal republic uh, democratic state when it has become every leader has come to power by bashing india and there is a common understanding among the nepalese as i understand is that they say any individual who does an india bashing is the future prime minister of nepal so that is the kind of notion that they created okay why that was created again because they thought that india has become a dominant position in nepal's politics and military and it wants to separate from india and create a very independent sovereign state because in nepal never had a history of you know um, of colonial rule and so nepalese are self dependent they can come to power and so the narrative was created that they are strong enough to decide on their own by discounting the fact that yet it is a small country it is between the two major powers which are flourishing right 
and it thought that if if it can make this balance from you know equi distance to equi proximity which oli's uh, statement was right that you create close closeness to not just india but to china so basically he wanted to push the pro china approach because it was a communist regime so if you had this equi proximity with two neighbors then you will be able to flourish then you will be able to have the economic development and i don't know whether that really happened or not but if you see the uh, the recent you know connotations of uh, of oli's time as well as the other leaders time is that they will come to india they will sign you know some agreements on infrastructure they will sign some agreements on energy they will sign some agreements on you know education cultural exchanges and things like that and then they will go to china and sign almost a similar agreements okay so in one sense the notion that the leaders are creating is that they want to take benefit for their own economic development because when they talk about their own economic development that is where the money will come into nepal yeah. and that is where the draining of from political leaders to the down level will begin the only thing which has changed now in nepal is that new individual parties and independent candidates are coming up which are talking about corruption you know they are like ravi lami chem is come with a party which is talking against corruption you know uh, balan shah in kathmandu is an independent candidate who's become the mayor of kathmandu he is talking about anti corruption so there are individuals who are coming up individual parties which are coming up who are talking about corruption and they are talking about establishing for the nepalese but if you see the history of that it's not like so yeah i mean you see that's the whole thing i wanted to actually take this discussion on a little bit of a different tangent because everybody talks about oli and the map he released and then yes. uh, you know prachanda said this and this and that but i think you brought out very interestingly that all this will continue but it really doesn't make a damn of a difference in terms of both the relations it's it's no. it's positioning it's strategic messaging whatever you may want to you know term it as which brings me to a very interesting kind of a question that you know there is no kind of benefit for the nepalese to kind to to antagonize india what is the benefit do they actually get something from china for actually doing the kind of stuff they do is there a is there a benefit that they get because one fails to understand more than leverage you know leverage fine i can understand you're leveraging between both the countries and and let me just say this openly for all the viewers if i was nepal i would do the same thing i would take one mm. banana from one two bananas from the other three from them three for them and continue you know enjoy myself in the middle but the positioning is like that but the actual ground reality is nothing he's not able to leverage with india or china so what is this this whole this whole i don't know misunderstanding misconstruct or i i wonder how to kind of uh, phrase it ma'am no i think you know uh, you're right in the in the position as a small power when nepal is uh, it will engage with all the neighbors in a multilateral forum right this is where it can uh, raise its own concerns and give get support from other parties two it will try to balance itself okay which has been a, a you know a static policy of nepalese leaders that they try to balance between india and china but as i said the ground reality for nepal is that even it want if it wants to dissect with india it's next to impossible okay but having said that what is the leverage nepalese get when they talk about nd india is as i said there is this china which is much more powerful which is materially you know very strong which can support in many of the issues uh, nepal wants right and it has done right so so if if nepal can get much larger benefit from china by just doing anti india bashing even if at the core it does not have that i think they will do it it's something like you know uh, i would say it's something like within a family okay if i have to curse my brother or my sister and fight with them to show to the others that you know uh, I, i can get some benefit from the outsiders finally we are one family you know fighting with your brother and sister you can always come back it's it's a blood relationship with india and nepal roti beti ka sambandh as we call it you know there are uh, linkages of marriages for the for the uh, you know indian women and nepalese women in, across the border the madhes area that you are talking about 
at the political level also if you see at the kathmandu you know there's so many political leaders whose relations are in india maybe in varanasi maybe in hyderabad maybe in delhi maybe you know uh, mysore or anywhere so bangalore i mean this is a whole spread of cultural ties with linkages uh, which they cannot dissect so it is like your own family so at the cost of like say bashing if you can get some benefits and if you see the benefits china has given to nepal is is really interesting because um, i mean uh, i have some you know statistics here which which tells me about the kind of relationship uh, you know china has built with nepal um say for example uh, you know um there was a three day goodwill visit of the chinese defense minister general uh, chang won chuan in march 2017 okay and uh, he headed a 19 member delegation to nepal and he was the first chinese defense minister to visit nepal after a gap of 16 years now you would say so what even if he visited what did he give to nepal what did nepal gain the trip actually materialized into what we call the first joint military exercise which is called as the sagarmatha friendship between china and nepal the chinese hmm. pla and the nepalese army okay and then there was uh, this 10 day long exercise resulted into uh, president xi jinping's visit right this is one aspect if you see then if you see the you know the bri it is already talking about the railway project so i'm not going to detail talk detail about that railway project but that is one aspect of it then very interestingly during the uh, you know oli's regime uh, he established something called as a protest free zones okay <laughs> and speeding up the intelligence units with the help of the chinese just before pm oli visited china now why was it done because it wanted to appease the chinese that tibetans will not protest that is what happened in 2008 as well where the chinese arm twisted the nepalis the tibetan protests were restricted and so that is one you know benefit that the oli's visit would be successful if they go there then if you see the nepal's armed police force academy which is located in the mountain stop of chandagiri you know municipality on the outskirts of kathmandu it was inaugurated by the chinese it uh, the building was uh, you know the academy had almost 19 buildings it was covering an area of 15000 square kilometers built in 2 years with the us dollar 350 million fund which came from the chinese you see what the chinese are what the nepalese are getting from the chinese okay then um uh, along the you know the surveillance of uh, tibetans and everything there is uh, there are entry and exit points which are created so that there is no smuggling that happens drug trafficking everything money laundering that is controlled through you know nepal and tibet that border area and uh, then there are you know three border points that are being created nepal is asking for nine border points they have only got three as of now uh, these are the trading points i'm talking about okay and then uh, there are highways which have been constructed by the chinese uh, the pokhara airport uh, you know international airport they please wanted the chinese to fund chinese are doing that chinese are also investing in uh, lumbini okay uh, there is a, i think a Thousand uh, square, thousand meter long Buddha statue that is being created in Lumbini. Ah, uh, hundred meter, sorry, hundred meter uh, statue of Buddha which is being created in Lumbini. That is created by the Chinese funding, and the Chinese are also investing in highway projects. Um, there is, ah, uh, there are trade agreements between China and Nepal. So, and China has given their transit, you know, ports, so you can have free transit from their ports. Whether the transportation cost will be there or not, I am not talking about all of that. uh and then there are uh, you know there is this company called uh, peqing chunghai changhu investment company which is you know supporting the the buddha statue uh then if you see if the you know rail line which they are talking about comes to nepal uh, they are expected to have 2.5 million tourists from china coming to nepal which will be a huge huge money for the nepalese because nepal is based on tourism right and then uh, the last thing is something like you know the the chinese are also giving them scholarships to all the students to get higher education for which anyway the nepalese uh, they don't have the facilities within their country either they go to they come to india or they go to any other western country 
so now and for that they had to shed money also because now say for example in india we have stopped many of their scholarships they don't get too much of scholarships in india uh, at least in jnu they don't have they have in sak university but they don't have in uh, uh, other places south asia university they have and so the chinese are giving them scholarship so free stay free you know education in that sense um so that is other thing um and then um the last thing probably is that the nepalese would uh, be able to negotiate with the chinese about this pri project uh, which they are planning to to have connectivity from china uh, say from xinjiang and all of that area to darchula to going to europe if that connectivity is made then nepal would be getting a lot of infrastructure and other benefits so this is what the debate within nepal is so why should they look into china these are the things because this money comes from china i mean i used we used to have this funny you know statements among us that they used to say that see for the nepalese it's like if india gives 500 rupees and chinese give 500 yuan and the americans give 500 dollars where would the nepalese fall depends right 500 dollars is always more than and this is what is the tussle now when you talk about mcc which is passed in china you know the us millennium project yeah. and and the jagma was there you see uh, jagma was is also having business in nepal so he is also putting a lot of investment the billionaire of china is coming to nepal to invest you see whether he invest in casinos or whether he invest in you know some spas or something like that is a different thing uh, casinos is another apart from the tourists casinos is one hub where nepal earns a lot of money you see the casinos which were there in nepal earlier and now they are making they are trying to make lumbini as a hub of casinos right they will get a lot of money they will they are planning to make lumbini something like macau or something like that you know what happened in cambodia probably something like that i wish they do ma'am it will be a cheaper yeah. you know international holiday for india at least ma'am lastly you know i want to ask you a very uh, interesting i think for you it would be very easy but for me it's a, it's a quite a tough riddle is that the chinese influence within nepal seems to be waning you know there there are multiple voices coming out now where they saying nahi nah, yaar baaki sab theek hai paise nahi lene we don't want to take money from china because it becomes a pretty grave problem look around us what's happening and this and that so that those voices are now becoming stronger and stronger and as a matter of fact i sent you a press release also where not a press release it was yeah. a it was a thread where somebody is actually enunciated how this particular thing is uh, sorry how this particular thing is actually damaging nepal so has today there been a shift of at least the understanding of the financial imperatives of dealing with china and how do you see this you know going forward in the future with 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 their balancing with india considering china is not going to be in the financial position to kind of dole out help as it it it, it would like to like last time when i was discussing with you i just mentioned about this railway project this is one example yeah. that's very crucial to see about how this nepal's you know china nepal railway project is going to cost a lot to nepal and this is where the debate started in nepal i would say that the, the present debate did not start from sri lanka you know it started from the china nepal railway thing of course sri lanka as a case in point is also an example for the nepalese to look into yeah. what can go wrong and then pakistan is also uh, a second example for them but when i talk about the china nepal railway line you know it was something like a us dollar 2.8 billion project right and if you see the you know the uh, senior bureaucrats in uh, in nepal uh, they were talking about they they expected china to at least you know bear some 30% of the cost okay and the rest will be fine uh, to nepal to bear the 30% of cost and the rest should be bared by the chinese right but china was talking about as i said the 60 40 part- partnership mm. ki china will take the 60% burden and the 40% burden should be taken by nepal uh, and nepalese were insisting that it should be 70 30 so 70% should be taken the burden should be taken by the chinese and 30% for the nepalese but even that 30% you know which nepal would have agreed the debate in nepal was how much of that would be a cost of say us uh, dollar 800 million for one project okay and considering that you know 
you know the annual budget of nepal is something around uh, at that point it was 15 billion, <coughs> billion us dollars i mean for one project if you are going to shed out 800 million us dollars how would you sustain the whole economy right and for that uh, they were thinking maybe adb will come to help you out uh-huh. that will not happen uh-huh. that will not happen yeah. for a for a chinese project right the other interesting thing in this project itself was that that 60% or 70% whatever chinese would have agreed at the end uh, they have not yet agreed on any of that even if the the chinese would have agreed on the 60% will not be grants it would be loans right and so as i said the debate started here when there is a loan okay and you have to repay that loan that 70% you see that cost would be a cost on nepal so so when the sri lanka thing happened the hamban tota i'm talking about the project thing happened then this debate became more ignited in nepal ki what will happen if you know there are all loans on us you see and at the same time us and the western forces started to you know uh, arm twist the nepalese they stopped giving them adb funds for projects saying that you you already have and they saw the the reaction that came to pakistan pakistan is going with the begging bowl to every state and asking that you give us the loan and finally okay adb has agreed but in the sense there is a lot of problems so that so nepal watches all of these countries reactions and what is happening within these countries by taking those loans and nepal does not want to fall into that so so what is the present situation for nepal is absolutely you are right that they are a little wary about taking loans okay and they are looking forward for infrastructure grants and projects this is also where see nepal is still a underdeveloped country right and considering that it has not reached to a developed level uh, it has uh, it, it understands its international position okay which is where it can be given grants by the developed countries okay mm. and it would want to fully utilize that so i always see nepal political elites as well as individuals are more conscious of their rights being a small power rather than just being a small state you know so when they look themselves as a small power they also know their geo strategic position and how they can take advantage of the geo economics which is happening across the globe this is where it is very active in almost all the international forums it wants to go there actively participate in that and then understand which is where their interest lies okay so if today when nepal you know the people as well as the government the politicians are realizing that they are not going to get greater benefit from china because china is now at, at least under xi jinping's present you know uh, reaction is that that if you if we give you something what is that you offer to us you know it is not just a grant that we given kharat mein tumhe de diya और तुम जाके आराम करो वाली बात नहीं आप उसके बदले हमें क्या दो यू सी एंड नेपलीज आर नाउ पॉन्ड्रिंग अपॉन हम उसके बदले क्या दे सकते सी फॉर इंडिया इट वाज नेवर अ प्रॉब्लम टिल टिल दिस टाइम आई मीन नाउ दे मे से दैट यू नो मोदी गवर्नमेंट इज नॉट डूइंग दिस और दैट नॉट डूइंग दैट बट टिल दिस पॉइंट ऑफ टाइम नेपाल डिड नॉट हैव टू थिंक अबाउट गेटिंग एनीथिंग फ्रॉम इंडिया इन टर्म्स ऑफ ग्रांट्स से फॉर एग्जांपल द अर्थक्वेक इन 2015 okay who was the first to help nepal india obviously and we had given you know millions and billions of rupees for uh, earthquake reconstruction we actually called up china also to support okay because it's a humanitarian uh, you know crisis hmm. whether china does or not because china did not come so quickly it came almost at the last position and then now when they are giving any aid to nepal there are terms and conditions attached to it. where you can use these aids what will be the you know uh, the end result of it how would china get benefit out of it say for example the recent reports that are coming out is every now and then uh, china links the projects that have been done say for example the po- pokhra projects right in pokhra international airport uh, whatever you know the projects china funded it says it is under the bri okay uh, of late uh, the latest news which has come is that the wechat pay- wechat payment china says all yeah, wechat yeah. payment between china and nepal especially in the bordering areas is under the uh, you know bri now the nepalese diplomats have become shocked 
hearing that because for them, when they signed this agreement, there were projects that they wanted to implement. But all of these projects had to have a feasibility study and then, you know, discussions and how that will be implemented. And the Nepalese diplomat, the uh, the foreign minister, Saudi, has openly come and stated that till date, we have not started a single project under BRI. But the Chinese state, we have already started. We are, all kinds of projects are under BRI. Now, if the Chinese demand something in back, you cannot just take money and we are Dakar market bad gaya, bhame kuch nahi chahiye. Thank you very much. Aise nahi chalega na. So Chinese says, yeah. ki uske baad aap kya kar rahe hain? Aapne paisa liya, uska hamar ko kya mil raha hai return? Aap phir jaake India ke saath apna dosti kar lete hain, wo nahi chalega. Aap hamare project kariye. Ab, see, Chinese interest of all railway projects is to come to Indian market. Not just to stay in Nepal. Nepal is a very small market for them. Hmm. India is hmm. the major market. Right? It, it needs to at least come to uh, Tarai border, that is the you know Indian border. Okay, but Nepalese want that if you have to build a railway project, then please build up a highway to Pokhara and develop our international airport of Pokhara. So Chinese says, what is the benefit of that? I mean, we have developed it. We are not going to get anything. And yeah. now because China itself is struggling with the economic crisis post-COVID, okay, there are economic challenges within uh, in China. The companies, many of them have got better. There's huge debt on banks. You know, there is unemployment, which is coming up. The Chinese businessmen who are investing in Nepal are also very, very, you know, cautious about where they, you know, invest and how much they invest. The tourists have already gone down. Uh, the number of tourists who were going to Nepal have really come down. Drastically, I, I should say, they've come down. And uh, the investments that were coming by the private businessmen, the Chinese businessmen, also come down in Nepal. Okay, because they do not see that much of potential in Nepalese market to bring huge profits for the Chinese companies. So that is also the reason why the Nepalese are also rethinking about, you know, why they should be really cautious about what they engage with China. One, you have to pay back, right? And two. The the profits that incur, if the Chinese take away all the profits, they come and you know employ their own people. The employment is of the Chinese, you know, the, their local employees, uh, and they do not uh, support the local Nepalese. So so Nepalese also because post COVID, every country is rethinking about their employment issues, about poverty issues, about economic development issues, about for Nepal its tourism, all that thing. That's also one of the reasons why Nepalese have become a little more cautious about China. And of course, as you rightly point out, the examples of the neighboring states as well, you know, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, what is yeah, what I is mean, happening in Vietnam? It's really amazing that. Uh, but one thing I must say, I must I must commend the 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 strength of the Nepalese le leaders to actually play this game. It's it's quite an uh, you know. Uh, I I am not getting the right word for this. It. Quite a quite a strenuous thing for them to actually beat between both these giant powers next to them who are you know uh, wanting the nepalese to be with with their i mean i won't say india is wanting them to be with their agenda but i <clears throat> india is probably wanting nepal to be on their side so it's it's, it's but quite i think you see uh, one of the things which we fail to understand about chinese psyche is that Chinese were not very confident of Nepal at any point of time. They always knew that Nepal's closeness to India is more than China's closeness to Nepal. China cannot replace India in terms of relationship. Okay, Even if the Chinese are now making inroads in Madhes, right? They have started to have business and you know shops and you know, you know, some hotels and everything in Madhes as well which is the dominant area of uh, India-Nepal relations. Uh, yet, you see, the Chinese were never, ever confident about Nepal to give them the complete support as they give to India. Okay, mm. They always uh, saw Nepal with a you know, pinch Suspicious. of salt, mm. suspicion sort of thing. And second, the collapse of the NCP. You know, ne Chinese did a lot of work to unite the Communist parties. And Oli became the Prime Minister, right? And there was an understanding Prashant that will come to uh, become the prime minister. But when these two parties collapsed, okay, there was a division. 
and even within the uml party you know the jalnath khanal and everyone they also you know separated from the uml parties then the 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 faith that chinese bestowed on the nepalese also collapsed you see so chinese really do not think that they can fully trust nepal in in forcing them to do what they want them to do you see and the second thing is in terms of uh, you know the conflict between india and nepal which has give, become more uh, you know prominent after 20s in 2020 uh nepal did not blindly take the side of china and this is where the you know the complex situation where nepal is put to that whether it will take side of china or india for the 1962 example for the chinese is that nepal will side with india yeah even if actually nepal did not side with india but at least you know the space that they talk about the kalapani area and everything you know the gorkhas were supporting the indian army we have the gorkha army we we are supported by the gorkhas uh, the manik shaw's record all tells about how the nepalis army were supporting indian army right so you think the chinese pla will think that you know nepal will be even if the gorkha start to today joined uh, the pla neither they will be given higher positions nor they will be trusted completely okay and if china looks at nepal china does not look at nepal as a sovereign state as a equal partner you see it looks as a small entity which needs to be subservient to the rulers of china so nepal is also understand that if prachanda ji is now trying to go to china and there is whole whole debate coming up in newspapers saying that you know prachanda ji may not be invited by the chinese right now maybe after august or something because uh the chinese are not getting what the the you know what the nepalese should be doing so so there is discontent by the chinese chinese are not happy whether and what nepalese have done uh, even if all these narratives are floating in the newspaper fact of the matter is nepalese always went with a you know with a boto noto kind of a posture to the chinese and then chinese agreed to certain things and did not agree to certain things. but in india they did not have to do that in india they had all kinds of back channels and you know track to diplomacy playing ngos connections you know relatives connections even at the uh, you know uh, at the highest level you see we had uh, people speaking nepalese and nepal india connections were very very sort may not be exactly equal relationship maybe nepalese would not agree to that proposition but at least they had a ease of communication they don't have that in china that is true ma'am that is i mean you know see that's the whole thing the connection is not that simple i think you brought it out very very beautifully in this episode uh, one thing i must tell you ma'am you know you 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 spin it around in a way and when i have used the word spin it's not uh it's not filled with rhetoric it's it's filled with realities but it's it's spun in a way that you can actually relate to the 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 particular factor of the culture the the ethnicity and the religion and the connect connectivity that i spoke about right at the beginning and you brought these three four things out very very beautifully ma'am my commendations to you uh you. nepal is an interesting subject that i've been wanting to actually delve with but funnily speaking a lot of people who deal with nepal uh, who have spoken very few have actually been able to give me a correct picture and i think you've you've rounded up that picture very well So thank you so much ma'am for this obviously a wonderful opportunity I'm going to disturb you more and more in the future because I need to learn sure. what all you have learned and it is going to be for the benefit of our countrymen uh thank you for your service and thank you for the knowledge that you share with us till next time knowledge ma'am knowledge is for dissemination I always believe that the more you share the knowledge the more you learn <laughs> anyway thank you very much for inviting thank me here on channel thank you good day jai